could start in Italian, but that seems a bit silly because this was in English. <laughs> mm, true, good point. <laughs> uh, so I'll say instead, hello and welcome back. It's been too long since we teased you with one episode of this new season and then basically disappeared for a month. But we're back and we are here with our second episode in this uh, masked superhero comic book season, whatever we're calling it. Um, <laughs> my name, is, I'm all over the place today. My name is Adrian and I am joined by my co-host and one might say the king of criminals himself. It's Rod Barnett. Hello, Adrian. My friends call me Diabolicus. Yeah. <laughs> but I have no friends, so there. No, yeah. yeah, they're so weird that the Italian title for the, I think it's the second film, is The King of Criminals. Um, but he's not. He's like the hero. It's very strange. Anyway. I thought the Italian title was like Super Argo Contra Diabolicus. Uh, yeah, the second. The, the the second film, The Faceless Giants, I think it's called Il Re di Criminali. A, oh, yeah, the, yeah. A Superago, the King of Criminals is Superago. I mean, King of Wrestlers, maybe? I, I, mean, he's, I don't know. He's definitely, we'll get to this, but he's a wrestler and he cheats an <laughs> awful lot, in my opinion. Oh, really? Well, that's a, that, that opens up an, an entire discussion. Hold on. We, yeah, we'll get we'll get to that. Um, so yes, welcome back everybody, and we are uh, here, ready to talk about superheroes and supervillains again. Now, one thing I wanted to mention because I've been forgetting to do this uh, the last few episodes is the podcast is now also available on YouTube, and so if you just search for Wild Wild Podcast on there or find the links on our feeds, um, then you will also see that you can listen along i don't know why like youtube is a video site but audio content seems to be just as popular so yes yeah the entire back catalog is now there on youtube and i should say that since i did this um just before christmas we've had about four thousand hits so that's not bad is it well, that's not bad how many episodes have we gotten up all of them uh, there's about 50 something okay yeah. good good um, would you like to guess, Rod? Let's play a little game. Would you like to guess what the most popular episode is on YouTube? Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm going to take a wild guess and say um, one of the science fiction films, maybe, Wild Wild, po Wild Wild Planet? Now, you would hope that people were finding our podcast because they were searching for top quality chat on cult Italian cinema. Oh my but bear in mind that there's a lot of people searching for smut on YouTube. The hell you so, say. <laughs> I know, it surprises me too. Um, so with that in mind, what might our most popular film be, do you think? Oh my God, smut? Um, yeah. I'm having to cast my mind back over the films we've covered. Which one had the maximum amount of at least potential <laughs> smut? Um, <laughs> I don't, so many I don't, to choose from. I don't, yeah, I don't know which one that would get okay. picked out of the lot. Let me put you out of your misery. So most of the episodes that I've put up have all had between 100 and 200 um, views. But then way out on top with two and a half thousand views is Il Reconti di Viterbari, a.k.a. The Sexbury Tales. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness you're kidding me i know oh. right there you go oh your instincts that uh, that uh, a, a mini season of uh films about a naked italian women really has paid off i know just it was a hunch what can i say <laughs> <laughs> yeah a hunch in other words i want to yes. talk about naked naked italian women from the 70s yeah. rod right? let's well, get on there you it go. So, yes, if you haven't checked out what is now, by a country mile, our most popular episode, then do go back <laughs> and uh, and listen to our episode on the... We did a whole sort of mini-season of Canterbury Tales, uh, Arabian Nights, all of that Decameron uh, trilogy yeah. films, which was good fun. Anyway, there you go. So if you're not subscribed to us on YouTube, please do, because I think the more subscribers we get, the more you know people love. find us the more love yeah. we get although clearly people are finding us all right without that uh, or at least they're finding that one episode but uh, anyway 
well, do subscribe. Let's, let, let's admit right up front that clearly we should point out that we, as podcasters, are essentially seeking uh, seeking attention from the public because we we lack a, a firm base of. Of a, of a real personality in our own lives and we we feel that we, we if we don't get that affirmation from people outside of our, our immediate families then we will curl up and die so please please um, pay attention to uh, us yes and of course well, i mean i don't know about you but i can't really speak to my immediate family about any of this crap so uh oh yeah i have to do it here <laughs> well i luckily i well to, well to only one 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 member really i mean and she has no, she has you know she's she'll be trapped in the car and can't can't escape into another room yeah, so she has to listen enough. to me at times so fair enough um yeah now so one of the reasons that we have been missing for a month is because shortly after we recorded that first episode a uh, another commentary track opportunity drops into our laps yes um but it had to be done in about a week or two two weeks maybe yeah, we turned it around in about two weeks so and then I had to go on a trip to the Middle East for work, which was pretty cool. I have to say, but it's, but it's something he can't talk about. It's super secret because the government will come and take him away <laughs> if he speaks about it. So yeah, it's been a pretty busy uh, start to the year. Now that commentary track, we it hasn't been announced yet. Um, no. So I think all we can say, we could say something. We could just say it's for a long, basically a long lost horror film i mean i would say it was pretty much lost wouldn't you um let's put it this way uh if i if i put it this way this will this will vague it up pretty hard okay it's a film that i had seen before and therefore mm. recommended that we talk about it but the way in which i had seen it felt like i was watching a third generation vhs copy with some subtitles and so this mm. Coming uh, soon to a retailer near you is an amazing upgrade of a uh, a 70s Spanish horror film. Let's put it that way. Oh, oh there we go. That's narrowed it down a little bit. Um, speaking of Spanish, let's get to our films for today. So, Because they are Spanish co-productions, which does have some impact, I think, on why they are what the way they are and who the cast is and all of that. Yep. So we are, of course talking about the masked superhero Super Argo Actually, the music I stuck in there is the Super Argo theme from the second film, Super Argo and the Faceless Giants, mm-hmm. um, because that one is more fun. It's like a kind of Batman style theme. Um, but some of the music in the first film, Super Argo versus Diabolicus, mm-hmm. sounds very James Bond like uh, to the point where you might think that Eon would be considering suing the filmmakers. It is it is very close, it's true. Yeah. I'll drop a little bit of that in here too because you can hear just how bondy this actually is. might talk about the music a bit more later but just like to stick a bit in there at the beginning so yeah super argo 
two films um, made about two years apart mm -hmm. by two different directors, but the same lead actor. Not that it makes that much difference because we deliberately never see his face. And um, yeah, Rod, what is your history with the Super Argo films? Um, caught up with at least one of them. Uh, the first one, I do believe, years ago, uh, because of course, any any you know, as soon as you see something like uh, Diabolic from from Bava, you wanna you, you wanna root around in that genre a little bit, and it's it's a pretty shallow pool. There aren't a whole lot of them, so I was able to see a good number of them, uh, even when it was you know gray market and bootlegs, things of that nature. And so my history with the Super Argo films is consistently getting them confused with each other and trying to remember which one was the first one and which one was the second one. Mm -hmm. um, it's not helped by the fact that the second one almost pretends the first one doesn't exist. But the, uh, the, the joys of them are a multitudinous, and it wasn't until... Uh, I, I can't remember exactly when I realized that the Super Argo films were essentially a kind of European answer to the El Santo-style films from Mexico... Uh, yes. but, but because there are a lot of similarities, but my history with them is thinking that until until just a few years ago, thinking that they were eh, worth worth a single watch, but not worth revisiting. I I have changed my tune over the past five or six years, mm -hmm. and uh, I will say that I do have, believe it or not, uh, uh, what I think is a Spanish or Mexican, probably Mexican, lobby card. For the second film. Oh, nice. Framed on my wall. It was a gift from a dear friend of mine who has since passed on. He gave it to me probably more than 20 years ago now. And uh, this, uh, it, it, it's hung, you know, it's ha it has pride of place to my left currently on the wall in my uh, office. And so my history with the Super Argo films is, uh, you know, f first was a big, eh, all right. And nowadays, I'm a big fan and really hope that eventually both of these films come out in some kind of nice uh, Blu-ray set that will give them yeah. uh, a lot of extras that place them in their historical perspective. Nice. Can you send me um, a photo of that and I can put it on our Instagram? Yeah, sure. Of course. I'll do that. Uh, I'll do that later today. Now, it's interesting that you mention, of course, the El Santo, uh, the masked wrestler connection here because this is a co although it's an italian is written by italians but it was a co-production with the um spanish market and there was very much an eye towards marketing it to spanish-speaking countries mm -hmm. uh because it's because italy's never really been into wrestling whereas wrestling was huge in spain which i think is why they make him a wrestler in the first place but also even the name so i didn't know this until i was reading this up in uh roberto curti's book Diabolica, which I'm referencing quite a lot in this season. And he mentions here how El Santo, um, the film, there were only a few films that were shown in Italy of El, El Santo's films, but they changed his name in the Italian versions to Argos because they didn't want, apparently, they didn't want film goers to confuse El Santo with the Simon Templar, the saint um, oh. film, sort of Yes. I'm not sure if it was the Roger Moore ones. I guess it must have been the Roger yeah. Moore. Yeah, Ro Roger Moore uh, played in the, the middle, in the mid '60s, yeah. and it was a pretty it was a pretty popular thing um, in a lot of different countries for a long period of time. Yeah, it was called Il Santo in Italy. Um, so Santo's name was changed to Argos, and so Super Argo was originally the title while it was in production was Super Argos. Hmm. So it was very deliberately based on Santo. And this is where I get to my point about him being a massive cheat at wrestling. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at the beginning of the film, we start out in the wrestling ring and he accidentally kills his fellow wrestler who turns out to be a close friend. Mm -hmm. And he's feeling terrible guilt about this and he's going to quit wrestling and all that. And then he immediately gets recruited <laughs> to be a secret agent. To prove how good a secret agent he could be, they show how he's basically... Um, super strong you can freeze him you can burn him he's impervious to pretty much everything except electricity so and they never really explain where all that power comes from oh but yes they do do they did they i give miss us, something they give us a, a line of complete bs to try to 
to try to make everyone just go along with it. I will quote. Uh, what I missed it. It's the somatic configuration of Super Argo's organism is identical to that of any normal human, but his metaphysical equilibrium is so perfectly balanced that it gives him superhuman resistance. So there, see, total oh. complete explanation. How did I forget that? Well, look, <laughs> I mean, to me, that's basically because it's techno babble. It's basically cheating, right? Surely. If he's impervious to all that stuff, he's effectively like he's on steroids. He shouldn't be allowed to fight normal humans when he can, you know, clearly he's better than all of them. So I think he's a bit of a cheat, personally. And he's, well, that's, uh, that's an interesting way to look at it. I, haven't really, uh, I hadn't really considered the, uh, the, that aspect. It's not exactly a fair fight. <laughs> well, yeah, but and, and what's weird is that, okay, so in this movie, he's, he's wrestling a guy who does turn out to, be his, uh, to have been a friend of his who he accidentally kills. So one would think that his, his buddy who he's in the ring with would have known how, you know, how impressive yeah, a physical true. specimen he is. So, you know, yeah. gentlemen, gentlemen's agreement here, you know, we're, we're doing an entertainment right yeah. so uh, this this is you know th th this is a real this is an even sadder thing because clearly yeah. if this guy was super argo's friend and he accidentally kills him this is yeah. uh this is a this is a deep dark hurt and mm. points to the reason why this movie really is very different from all those el santo yeah. and blue demon and mil mascara mascaras films from mexico because this is uh super argo has uh has feelings folks Mm. He's got also uh, he's got dimensions. Also, um, although I don't pick up on this at all, but maybe I missed it, just like I missed that other bit. Um, apparently, he's also a concentration camp survivor. Oh, That's wow. part of his part of his backstory, according to Roberto have... Curti. Now I'm forgetting. Okay, so if that's in there, I I, I have yeah. in my two recent viewings of it completely mm. zoned right out I mean, on that one. Maybe that's only in the Italian language version. I don't know. Because I completely missed that, if that's true. But, yeah, so a complex kind of dark um, backstory for Super Argo. But before we get more into him, should we just talk a little bit about the director and, and some of the cast, and then we'll sure, sure. get into the plot. So this film is directed by Nick Nostro, which is a great name, <laughs> and a director that I was not formally familiar with, but I quite enjoyed looking through his... Um, his list of credits. He was a second assistant director on a load of interesting things, including a couple of films by our favorite duo, Franco and Chicho. Oh, okay, yeah. So he did a couple of those. He did a, a kind of James Bond one, Secret Agents Against the Three Enemies, as assistant director, and then one called Two Samurai for a Hundred Geisha. And you can guess who the two samurai are, of course. So, uh, <laughs> That, so he, yeah. he was assistant director on those. assistant director on yeah. those and then he directed only i mean for somebody working in genre cinema in the 60s he didn't actually make that many films in about a 10 year period he only made 10 films mm -hmm. you know, whereas some directors are making you know 10 in a year uh that's not very many but you know is he a director whose work you're familiar with bef you know, before apart from super argo well, I had uh, not paid attention to his name until uh, sitting down to really think about these Super Argo films. But it turns out of the ten films he's listed as director on, I've seen uh, four of them. So, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I've seen Revenge of the Black Knight, uh, Spartacus and the Ten Gladiators, Operation Counter Spy, and this one. Uh, which okay. means that, you know, if I really wanted to work hard, I could just go ahead and see all of the films that he supposedly directed. So there, there's that. Yeah, and then it looks like he just took early retirement, I think. I don't um, know what happened with him. Uh, with yeah. some people on this uh with some people on this um on the on these two films, uh it's easy to determine why their career stopped at a certain point because for instance, one of the composers passed away. Uh and so that's why his career stops at a certain point yeah but the uh yeah i'm not sure exactly what uh what he did i'm not sure if he moved yeah. into some kind of different uh different I, uh status in the film yeah i've tried or? well he is he originally went to university and studied law mm -hmm. so his nickname was the uh, professor ah. you know, because he was qualified and, and sort of considered to be studious i suppose 
But I haven't been able to find any evidence as to whether that's what he went back into. So I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, he, he stopped directing at the age of 40. Um, but then he lived for another 40 years after that. So not really sure. But um, yeah, the, the last film that he made was... I've mentioned this on the podcast before, how there's a, a load of these Italian sex comedies with hints of incest. <laughs> this just seemed to be a oh common thread. So his last film is called Grazie Zio, Ci Provo Anche Io, which means thank you, uncle, I'll try too. Oh so my. I can't, I'm not entirely sure if that is another one of these, but just the fact there's an uncle in the title and the poster is a mustachioed Italian man, presumably the uncle, with a young, beautiful, naked girl in bed, just makes you wonder whether. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does, it does. <laughs> so, yeah, there's. There's a whole, there's a lot to unpack there. Oh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I don't think we'll be rushing to do that as a mini season anytime soon. <laughs> Incestuous sex comedies. <laughs> yeah. Well now, well, now you put it like that, maybe. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> so suddenly, what? Suddenly you're enticed. I'm, I'm worried. Well, now you could put if you could put it into three words, then it sounds quite snappy. Um, <laughs> oh my god! Oh <laughs> but no. yeah, so. Yeah, so apart from being the professor and passing away just uh, about 10 years ago, I can't really tell you anything about Nick Nostro. But uh, as we said, this is a Spanish co-production, so I did wonder if there are any uh, Nashi connections here with the cast or anyone else involved that, oh, uh, that you were well, aware of. Quite a number. Of course, we'll start with the uh, title character himself, Diabolicus, uh, Gerard Tichy, and I'm never sure if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Uh, he... Uh, had an amazing career. If you've ever seen a movie that had people speaking in a non-English European uh, language, you probably have seen him somewhere. Uh, he worked right. with Nashi in uh, several films. Uh, he was in uh, The Beast and the Magic Sword. Yes, yes, oh, yes. Oh, nice. And, I think uh, that's that's one of, that's one of the few Nashi films I've actually seen. Oh, well, you should, you should, uh, as I have said to you on many occasions, yes. see more, but, yes. but, uh, Gerard Tigi had an incredible career, uh, in Spanish films. Uh, he was also with Nashi in, uh, the film known as the hanging woman or, uh, well, it goes by a dozen other names as well. But the uh -huh. thing about, uh, about this particular actor is he, he, he was very much beloved and, uh, uh, very well thought of. Uh, you can also see him in some other great Spanish horror films like The Corruption of Chris Miller, uh, some uh, in Bava's Hatchet for the Honeymoon, mm. and uh, which, you know, Spanish Italian co production, nevertheless. Yeah. Uh, but also some really great uh, uh, spaghetti westerns as well. One of my favorites, Compañeros, he's in, mm. and uh, Bullet for Rommel. Uh, right. Sartana does not forgive quite a few, but uh, he's a really good actor, and uh, it's it would not be much of a stretch to say that he's one of those actors who, uh, uh, even though he uh, was in a 1960s Jess Franco film, was also in films like Dr. Zhivago, so he kind of strode the line between bigger uh, American productions being produced in Europe. I mean, he plays Jesus's dad in King of Kings, so give the man some credit. Uh, and he's in the um, the Blanchville Monster, mm -hmm, which yeah. didn't you did you write about that one for the Arrow in the Arrow oh, box set? No, I, did, I didn't write about oh. that one. Uh, Troy and oh, I you covered wrote about it. The other one. Uh, Troy and I covered it over on the Nashi cast uh, because oh, it has yeah. so many Nashi connections beyond yeah. just. Uh, beyond just gerard oh, okay. but uh but yeah uh heck of a heck of a heck of a film uh, mm. uh kind of a, a slightly different variation on the standard gothic stuff but yeah. he's a really fine actor and like i say was in a lot of different kinds of films yeah. and uh he lends he lends real credibility and gravitas to this movie uh and uh i can't i can't escape talking about him without mentioning his uh his role in uh the legendary pieces as well of course so yes uh, so people There's... pieces if you pieces. ain't seen it you're missing out he's also of course in mystery on monster island let's not forget that one. Oh, and well the sea serpent as well the yeah. uh, one of the last one of the last films that he did uh one of but one of the the one of the well the last amando diasorio film and mm. 
I'll, I'll praise but him out of the Osorio, but not 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 praise that film probably. So. What an incredible life he had! He was a because he, he was German originally, uh, lieutenant in the army in, in World War Two. When he was captured and held in a prison of war camp in France, he managed to escape and fled to Spain, and then just spent the rest of his life in Spain. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. Now, as for the rest of the cast, uh, as you might expect for a Spanish co-production, quite a few connections there as well. The mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Diabolicus's uh, lovely girlfriend, played by uh, Lordana Nusiki? Nus okay, I'm, I'm going to blow it. Nusak? I, I would say Nusjak. Nusjak, okay. Good. Yeah, we're, but we're I could... I could I could also be wrong. It's an unusual name, considering mm -hmm. she's um, she is Italian, and that's not an Italian name, Nusjack. I, I know. Yeah, it's, her parents it's, it's, maybe. I mean, she's from Trieste, which is sort of over there on the border. With uh, so maybe her father was from somewhere else, but yeah. Anyway, sorry. Oh well, no, no, no. I mean, she's in a she's in a number of things that people might recognize mm. her from, not least of which would be Django. Django. Mm. Yeah, is is she the girl that he rescues at the beginning of the film? She's uh, being, yes, she's the one that kind of becomes his girlfriend her. through the yeah. film. Yeah. And not only and not only that, she's also uh, in uh, a few other films that people might have known mainly because one of them, Ten Thousand Dollar Blood Money, uh, has now been released on uh, uh, Blu-ray. Yes, so by, that one's by very, Arrow, I think. Yes, so that one's easier to see, and she's uh, she's the uh, uh, main female uh, actress. She's the main actress in that film, and uh, that film I can highly recommend. Now that I've seen that one, uh, that one's uh, that one's a hidden little uh, spaghetti western gem, in my opinion. Mm. Um, but she was in she was in uh, several films. Her career is mostly in uh, the sixties. The, the and then kind of uh, goes away. I'm assuming that she's one of those actresses who, once you got... see, Although she worked intermittently throughout the, the 70s, I suspect that uh, she decided to go and do something different uh, at a certain point. And I'm assuming that that may have been uh, raising a family. But you never can tell. Mm. But she is a lovely lady and, mm -hmm. and uh, acquits herself quite effectively in this film as well as the other films that I've seen her in. Yeah. There's also Monica Randall, who plays uh -huh. Super Argo's girlfriend, and she has a bigger role in this than you might think, mainly because if you've got a girlfriend, then guess what? You've got leverage over yeah. your hero. You can uh, torture the girlfriend, make the superhero do whatever you want him to do, and so that's, of course, her position yeah. in this film, sad to say. But it's it's almost like they are ex they're, they're kind of expecting her to get kidnapped, because they they make a special brooch with a camera in it mm -hmm. that she can wear so that he could like, cause they give this to him. They give him all these weird gadgets. And one of them is this shiny brooch with a camera. I'm like, I was thinking, well, what's he going to do with that? And then of course it's obvious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, Monica Randall turned up in a, a, a number of films that people might've seen, including uh, 1971's red sun with Charles Bronson and, and uh, an international cast there, but she uh, she's also in uh, the excellent uh, Giallo, My Dear Killer, and um, she was in Pancho Villa, another Spanish film. But for Spanish horror fans, uh, she is prominent in the Witch's Mountain, uh, the oh. the uh, the uh, Cross of the Devil, which was a film that was written by Paul Nashi but directed by someone else. Uh, and then uh, she turns up in a prominent role in Nashi's first directorial film, Inquisition, uh -huh. in 1976, and had a fairly long career, as a matter of fact. Uh, she seems to have found her niche and uh, have been in quite high demand on Spanish television, working up to last year still yeah. doing things. And so Monica Randall, uh thumbs up. Just in another attempt to plug your work, didn't you do a commentary for Inquisition? Uh, yes, actually, uh, Troy, uh, Troy Gwynn and I did. Uh, that was oh, our first. That was our first commentary. Was for Inquisition. Oh, nice. That's where we learned yeah. that we could do this without uh, without uh, shaking in our seats. So yes. <laughs> and of course, she's also just to bring it back to some Jallo. She's in My Dear Killer, mm -hmm. which is the film that starts with that amazing 
decapitation by um, Digger, <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, that's quite a film. It's a heck of a film. Oh, Recommended yeah. if you've never seen it. I like that one a lot. Um, good, yeah. So there we go. So that's, I think that's pretty much all of the main cast, except, of course, um, our main man himself, Ken Wood. Yeah. A.K.A. Yeah, well. Giovanni Chanfrilia. Um, but as you've talked about before, it's great when they give these guys uh, kind of American sounding names. Ken Wood. <laughs> Ken Wood. Generic uh, American. Yeah. Yeah. You and I have talked about him a, a little bit because mm. he uh, he's got a role in Castle of Blood. Um, mm. Not to not to not to let's toot just, our own horns there. But of course, we did a commentary track. For that. Yeah. yeah. We did like a commentary that. track together for uh, Castle of Blood. And so we talked a little mm. bit about. Uh, this particular actor slash primarily stunt man, um, he plays Super Argo in both the films, um, mm -hmm. and of course you never see his face. And I have to admit that's kind of strange. It's not. Uh, I, I love the conceit, but it's yeah. not as if the guy was ugly or anything. I know. There's one bit where they take his mask off and they all go, <gasps> and but they won't show us. And I, well, what? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, we can't tell from their reaction if he's. If he's hideously scarred or insanely handsome, we just we don't know. Yeah, there's a bit when I forget which film. Already, the films have become one big film in my head. At the <laughs> end, there's this whole thing where it's only you know, only his girlfriend has actually seen his face, right? And then at the end of the film, she says, "Oh well, we've beaten the bad guy, so you might as well take your mask off now." In oh, this yeah. boat, in this boat full of people, and he's like, "Oh yes," and he just whips it off. I'm like, "Well, that didn't take much." Um, it's as if you know you know mission <laughs> over face can yeah. come out to play i don't know mm -hmm. now of course one of his greatest credits that i think we cannot let go unmentioned is he is one of the fighting football players in the mr hercules versus karate the um antonio margariti oh, hilarious yeah, oh. hilarious yes. comedy so set it, in Hong one Kong. of us one of us finds it hilarious people oh, no even i don't i have to admit it's all it's pretty painful <laughs> it's awful i mean don't get me wrong it's it's antonio margariti made made a, a few films that i think are absolutely awful but that one's almost completely unredeemable it's just, yeah it's just but terrible. the the fight scene in the um in the chinese restaurant with all the foot with the american football team is pretty funny and so I guess he's one of those because, yeah, as well as um, acting, he is just he's got a huge list of credits as a stunt guy. Yeah. Um, you know, up to this dec you know, this century, I should say, like Gangs of New York. Mm -hmm. He's in a um, list of credits. It's yeah. Really, yeah. Pretty cool. Loads of things that we, that people will have seen. Last Temptation of Christ, for example. I he's know. even in um, Luigi Cozzi's Hercules. And a few of the other films we did, like 2019, After the Fall of New York, that we've talked about before. So, yeah, quite a guy. Not necessarily the greatest actor, but didn't no, have but to be. No, but it's, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, his, uh, it's his physical acting that they're, yeah. that they're wanting here in the first place. I mean, I think the director of the first film basically said, you know, he, he knew how limited uh, an actor this guy was. And so he took great, great pains to... Uh, find a really good uh dubber for him and i'm assuming yeah. that he's talking about the italian version of it um mm -hmm. but i have I, I think the uh, the english dubber did an excellent job as well mm -hmm. where we're looking at this guy who's who's physically really presents very well and in the action scenes and even just in moving you know moving around with the actors and and uh speaking the lines and and you know doing the standard things the the the, the stuff that you know, the, the blocking with the other actors it all looks very fluid he looks like the athlete and you know man of action that he really is yeah. and so that you know if you're going to hire a guy for that kind of thing it makes sense and he's He's, he, he, he does the job required, and I think that uh, it's, it's, it's probably for the best that he wasn't required, uh, even in the first film, to kind of present a lot of, uh, shall we say, emotional content on his face. If he wasn't capable of it, they may have gone in that direction for many reasons, and that may be one of them. Yeah, and I mean, we don't even see that much of his face because of his mask, but they, they haven't quite gone... It's like they tried to find um, a compromise. They haven't mm. gone full diabolic. 
So well, they you change his mask in the second film. Yeah, probably. the second one is better because the first one it kind of covers his whole face, but there's a big hole for his mouth mm-hmm. and big holes for his eyes, which just has the unfortunate side effect. Um, f- like when it's standing slightly further away, it kind of looks like, you know, he's doing Al Jolson. <laughs> God. Well, I had I hadn't thought about that, but yes, it is a black mask, and in the first <laughs> film, it does from far enough away, it could like yeah. could look like some some person doing blackface. I hadn't thought yeah. about that. Now I'll never so, be able to to avoid that image. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. You're welcome. So that's why I think the second film, the mask is better because it just covers his eyes this time, and leaves the rest of his face uncovered. Well, um, I mean, do we do we want to dig into the plots of these two films? That we could at least kind of yeah. just, to go over them briefly and and kind yes. of differentiate between them a little, like because I, I would. I'm just going to say up front, I think the first film is better than the second film. And I'm going to disagree with you, and Ooh. I'm shocked. I'm shocked to be able to say that, but that is okay. Yeah, that is where I fell, and I may be in the minority hmm. here, but I will be able to explain why. Okay. Yeah, Um, and we should also say, as you mentioned before, basically neither of these films are currently uh, legally available. Yeah, um, which is a real shame. So I mean, maybe my viewing was slightly sort of affected by that. So the first film, I have a DVD, which I think comes from an Italian DVD from like twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's because it's got the choice of Italian or English language, and it's widescreen and it looks really nice. But then the second film which is the one that's more easy to find. It's on YouTube. Yeah. But the um, once you get past the opening credits, it's been cropped to 4.3, but they've just cropped off the sides. And there's quite a lot of good use of widescreen in the second film where you've got objects on both sides or people talking to each other on both sides of the frame. And all we can see is the middle and just two noses poking into the frame, which well, for the is second a bit one, of a shame. I, 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 uh, yeah, we... The version that you can see of you know in in bootleg form of the first one is the full widescreen image, and the second one is cropped. But I did manage to find a version that was only cropped from uh, the two three five image down to one eight five. So there's more of the image okay. than in a four three. Thank goodness. Oh, um, good. Uh, but also you know, in still, the, yeah, in that English because the, the actual picture quality is really good. It's just a shame that it's missing the sides. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is in English. But also there's a bit in the final act where there's suddenly about six minutes just missing there's a huge plot hole and i was watching thinking what the hell just happened really but then i I, yeah but then i found an italian very poor quality copy on youtube that has that missing scene in it so i watched that in italian so i think i figured out what was going on but yeah there's a whole section missing because suddenly just i was like what this doesn't make sense what's just happened but i think a reel has dropped off it or something (laughs) Oh, that's weird. But yeah, so anyway, maybe that's why the. Se- but I just feel like the directing is a bit flat in the second one. But anyway, we can get to that. And yet, I feel okay. Yeah, we we we, we it's good that we're on separate continents. It'd be a nice okay. fight. So, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and my um, blood does not coagulate the way Super Argo's blood does. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's sh- let's discuss this before we go any yes. further into plot. Okay. Okay. So one of the ways in which in the first film we learn about the amazing physical abilities of Super Argo is uh you know they the 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 fellow who wants to turn him into who essentially wants to to enter super argo into uh special agent school uh yes as as far as i can tell as is is therapy to save him from apparent depression and possible suicide because of his feelings of 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 horror at having murdered one of his friends in the ring um Mm. there's a whole lot to talk about there if you want to delve into it folks but he uh he maybe stabbed him in the arm. So, maybe he wasn't such a cheat, then uh, it wouldn't have happened. That's all I, I, I can say. <laughs> so maybe it is his fault. Maybe suicide is the answer, Super Argo. Oh, but the, oh, this guy is like, in, in the book, he calls him Colonel Kinsky. He does. But I the, don't think that's the name I remember. I know. In the one. credits, it doesn't say, I can't see anyone called Colonel Kinsky. That's There's a lot. Colonel Kenton, so that might Kenton. be the same. One. In the English dub, I think that's the name. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yes. Oh, at, at, yeah. At he rate. says, "Look." He says, "I'm going to show you how cool Super Argo is," and then just stabs him. <laughs> oh, I know. Stabs <laughs> just... him in the arm. 
<laughs> and they're all shocked, and, and he's just like looking at his arm. Like, oh. And then they they take some of his blood, and I got to ask you: Do you think that we're because it really does look like there there's someone actually sticking a needle into yeah our main character's arm with yeah. drawing blood, and they, then they, I think they just actually do a, take a blood sample in real life. <laughs> which is which is odd. I, I love I love and this is one of my minor things for films. I, I really do enjoy uh, watching how they'll fake putting a needle into an actor, uh, and there are a dozen different ways to do it. And it, and it's great. I always like just you know checking out how they're doing it because I, I I'm not looking for that level of verisimilitude. Go ahead and yeah. fake it because there's no reason to stick a needle into an actor's arm. It's pointless. So when I see this and I'm going I think they really did it i wanted to make sure you thought as well thought that as well but um if he can get blood out of his arm with a needle Mm -hmm. why wasn't there blood on the knife when his friend just stabbed him in the arm okay you are using your logical brain and you need to stop (laughs) that is not where we are my friend that is not the kind of film we're watching you have stepped over the line oh sorry about that yeah yeah that's that's you need to back away Think about what you said. I'll put that put that back in the box. <laughs> Have someone go get a ruler and snap it across your 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 hand. Because man, come on. But here's the thing. So they sh- they they draw it as blood to, to demonstrate that it uh, why he w- one of the one of the great physical attributes that he has, which is that his blood coagulates very quickly. So he he can get wounded and and not really bleed to death. And there's a part of me that immediately threw up my arm and went, wait, 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 wait. Uh, won't this guy just die of a blood clot? I mean, what's keeping this What's keeping this from just killing him outright? I mean. How is it still flowing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it coagulates, I mean, there, there needed to be something in there about, you know, once it leaves his, you know, once it leaves his body or once it's yeah, below like body temperature or something. Contact with, contact with air or something. Yeah. I, that, see, that would have been good. Oxygen, maybe. there. Yeah. Or no, you can't do that because blood is oxygenated. It would have exactly. to be something else. Oh, God. <laughs> this is getting more complex the more I think about it. We should step away. But then they don't even, I don't know, they didn't really need for that to be one of his superpowers because they just gave him a bulletproof suit anyway. I know. So that was pointless, really. Oh, but, but it anyway. was cool and we got to stick a needle in the actor's yeah. arm. <laughs> <laughs> he goes through a few tests to prove how... He can withstand fire. He can withstand being frozen. Mm-hmm. Um, he can also withstand being electrocuted. It just hurts. Well, okay, look, it, 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 he goes through being frozen, or from what it looks like, he goes through being covered in shredded it's, coconut. I can't yeah. tell. So <laughs> it's like he's been sprayed with foam out of a fire extinguisher or something. Yeah, <laughs> but because I mean, it's lucky that they showed us that he can do that because then later in the film we get to see it all over again. Yeah, there's that attack with shredded coconut. No, I'm kidding. He gets, I'm he kidding. gets tortured later. And <laughs> well, put... and and that's so that's why they show us that so that we'll so that yeah. we as the audience won't feel any any concern at all when they're torturing him. Which one what yeah. one might expect that to have been a misstep, perhaps if you're trying to there's maintain also some level of tension. One of the the scene that's the sequence that's missing in the English language version of the second film, it, part of that is him being put into an Iron Maiden. There's like a torture chamber in the caves, and he's put into an Iron Maiden. And then when they open the door again, all the spikes have bent. So it's, he's quite a tough guy. Yes, yes. Almost nothing can harm this. But man again, is that his bulletproof suit that's made out of a special plastic, hmm. or is it that his blood is so coagulated that it bends metal? It's not entirely sure how his superpowers work. Well, I mean, he can definitely be stuck with a knife. And yeah. he does he does comment that you know he could be killed with a bullet except for I, the bulletproof suit. Yeah, so except that. if anyone can aim for his face. I mean, <laughs> well, you know that's, uh, that that is uh, <laughs> that is a standard concern for all yeah. non masked superheroes throughout eternity. <laughs> so yeah, but they give him this special plastic bulletproof suit. I just worried for him that it was going to be whether it was going to be breathable or not because he never takes this thing off. I know. I, mean, I think he sleeps in it, for God's sake. Yeah, and he swims in it, and he eats in it. He showers in it. Never comes well, off. In that respect, it is very much like the masked wrestler films from Mexico, where 
um, there is almost no indication at all in, uh, say, a, a, an El Santo film that these guys take that mask off. I mean, I, I have seen El Santo films where I swear he is stepping out of his shower with the damn mask on. So yeah. I, I, maybe, that, maybe that's what we're leaning heavily into here as well. Yeah, so we, let's get to the, the the bad guy, Diabolicus, whose name is never explained or why he's wearing an octopus on his special shiny suit is never particularly explained. I know, it, it, it's it's I mean, unless it's some kind of reference to Spectre, maybe? Well, maybe. Uh, I mean, something. that's certainly something you could put into a film like this and, and get away with. Yeah, he's basically a Bond villain. He The film begins with him and his crew attacking a ship mm-hmm. with their speedboats like pirates like somali pirates basically they board with their machine guns they steal all of the um like what is it mercury and uranium in the hold mm-hmm. and then they shoot everybody and head back to their secret um island base which is very much a, a whole the whole thing is very james bondy because he's going to he's turning uranium and mercury into gold which he's going to then use to flood the gold reserves. And I can't remember what the reason was for doing that. Was it to make gold worthless? Oh, well, it was to send everything back to the stone age or something. Right. The whole idea is to completely uh, destroy the monetary system of the world and then uh, claim uh, somehow or another. I can't, I can't remember the details, but this would allow him to essentially bring the governments of the world to their knees and he would be able to do what he wanted to. Um, but which is cool. And we should point out this film, the first film came out in 1966. And so this movie plays a whole lot like a Euro spy film from this period. We're deep into bond mania. Uh, the influence here is extremely strong because this is, if, if this guy was running around without a mask and without this, this comical suit, this would just be a standard Euro spy film, to be honest. Um, maybe with some incredible guy at its center, but it has all of, I mean, this is luchador movie crossed with Euro spy bingo. Here's your film. And therefore all of the things that you would expect from one of those movies is here, including, you know, the, the Island base, the super villain, um, you know, out for world domination. It's, it's, it's really strongly part of the Euro spy tradition. And that I think is one of the things that uh, really puzzles me about why this isn't better known. Uh, I just think there needs to be a lot more attention paid on, uh, on video releases from boutique labels to the whole Euro spy genre. And this would be part of it. Um, I don't want to say too much else about the plot because there's not, we don't want to give too much away. And this is a film that people could quite easily find and, and watch. And it is fun. Mm-hmm. I said I've preferred this one to the second one. And maybe we can, I can try and argue my case, I guess. Well, I will just but, say, uh, <laughs> without, without really digging heavily into it, I would just say that, to be clear, um, I think this one is more flatly directed than the second one. Mm. I think the second one is much more... Uh, much more uh, ambitious in its choice of shots, in its movement of the camera, and the way that it pushes the story forward using the camera to kind of uh, get everything moving and and push, 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 push. This one feels a little flat to me. Uh, And I felt that, uh, like I say, this is the first time I've gone and seriously considered these films for more than just you know eye candy entertainment and so i'm thinking about these movies as i'm watching them for the first time in other words i'm really considering where they where they differentiate and with Mm. this one it's it feels too flatly directed which is a a charge that i could make about a lot of the the lesser euro spy films from the period whereas the second one it feels like the director was trying to uh, was trying to prove something I mean, it seems like it seems like he really was leaning heavily into making a mark on this and and playing it up with uh, some dynamism in how he shot the film. And so for me, the second one moves so much more. The the complaints that I see Fair where enough. people talk about these two films uh, and and prefer the first to the second, and I will give them this. Um, 
the Super Argo character in the first film is a lot more of a complicated guy. I mean, seriously, I was not joking. He's he's mm. very depressed at the beginning of this film after he accidentally kills yeah. his friend. And this this whole enlisting him in the Secret Service to go be a secret agent thing can be read as uh, uh, both an exploitation of him, because, of course, what a resource, but also as a way to keep him from killing himself, to kind of save this man from a deep, dark funk. And that's interesting i'll grant you that it adds a le- it adds an, a level of interest to the story being told but if you're just looking for uh, an action uh, an action film with um kind of comic book overtones and uh, the strangeness that can come from that being your source material i like the second one i mean we're fighting robots we're levitating there's you know i mean yeah granted yeah. The, the character super argo in the second film is not as interesting there's not uh you can't yeah. you can't read depth into the the character in the second film the way you can in the first but man it moves like a shot i enjoy the second one more yeah fair enough um you mean there's some there's some really big sets i do think that it's basically super argo versus the cybermen to it, I, that was something that I kept thinking this time yeah. as well, whereas in it, previous view, viewings I had not really considered that. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, it does. It feels a lot like uh, because there's a lot of just roaming around in the woods, chasing men with um, robot masks. Well, and, at, and in those things. those amazing caverns that that set yeah. in those caverns. Oh, the caves are really cool. I I'm know. pretty sure I recognize those caves from other fil- other Italian films I've seen, though. They must be the same caves. Um, but it just it felt at times it did feel like an episode of Doctor Who because there's so much so much old <laughs> Doctor Who is just men in costumes with masks chasing somebody in the woods and of course um, twice this week including the second Super Argo I've watched a film where somebody's fallen into quicksand oh I know but they don't identify it in the film as quicksand it, it's, it's like quicksand yeah. in the middle of a forest which makes zero is it just, sense. Yeah, it's more like a swamp, but they treat it like quicksand, which was pretty funny. Because <laughs> I've also just been watching another, I think I watched Emmanuel and the Last Cannibals, which also features a uh, quicksand scene. Um, and it seems to come up with recurring regularity in these films. Is that it's the right It's word? very strange. Regularity. Anyway, we could mention then, okay, well, yeah. So I, I agree. I can see your point. I guess, I don't know. I sort of feel like the second film, the motivations for the villain are a bit less clear. What What's he going to do with these robots? Oh, it also reminded me of the Batwoman, the Mexican film. Yes, I can, that one, that. I can see that. I can see that. There's a doctor kidnapping sports people to turn them into fishmen. And <laughs> in this film, the direct, the um, they are kidnapping sports people to turn them into robots. Um, but why is he doing it? Is he going to the robot's going to help him take over the world i can't even remember what he wanted to do with them you know now that you mention it i can't either (laughs) but i'll be honest i don't care it's like do i do i need to really remember the motivations of the of the villains in these in these euro spy style films it's like eh, no no this one's this one's based on a fumetti let's just roll go fair enough yeah the second film is a different director Mm -hmm. paolo bianchini who has directed several films, none of which I'm particularly familiar with. Okay. Um, although he did do one of the Decameron sexy comedies, of course, like they all did. He also did a film that could feature in this season, but I'm, we haven't got time to fit them all in. He did a, um, a Superman comedy in 1979, so clearly based on the Christopher Reeve Superman films, right. called Super Andy, the Strong Brother of Superman. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like it's got potential, doesn't it? Um, it has potential to make me groan and suffer. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, yeah, so I'm not particularly familiar with anything that Paolo Bianchini has done apart from this Super Argo film, which came quite early in his career. And again, he the wrestling in this film, he does get to wrestle again, but this time it's a way of kind of trapping... You no, know, Because they're kidnapping wrestlers, so he mm-hmm. figures if he wrestles, then they might come and kidnap him, and that's how he's going to sort of find out what's going on Mm -hmm. but as you mentioned in this film he's learned some new tricks because he's a little bit like the Beatles because the last (laughs) film was 1966 this is 68 now 68 yeah so like the Beatles he's hooked up with a guru it's true 
he's been learning meditation the, the kind of meditation that lets him um, read people's minds um, kind of remote view yeah and levitate now for a lot of people I mean that's that, definitely cheat. That's cheating in okay. wrestling for oh, well, sure. Oh, oh, so you're, 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 you're going back to cheating. So your <laughs> your 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 overall takeaway from the Super Argo <laughs> films is Super Argo equal cheater, which is yeah. kind of I did not expect you to go there. That's he would intriguing. Be, he he would be banned by the uh, International Olympics Committee. <laughs> well, for, uh, for a number of reasons, I'm sure. But yes, okay. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give you that, which uh, mm. I'm. I'm really not wanting to give you. I'm going to admit to you. That's that's not a direction that I ever wanted to go. But if you're going to go in that direction, okay, sure, I got gotcha. you. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, be, beyond the, the, the plot mechanics and the cheating of the main character in the story. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the villain in this, sometimes I see people talk about Guy Madison, who plays our uh, our super villain in this one, yeah. as being uh, much weaker than Gerard Tichy of the, the previous films, and I can see that to a degree because he's not as as kind of physically imposing to a degree. No. Uh, and then you know when he goes, he tries to go one on one in the third act with um, with Super Argo. Basically, we're all just kind of trying to see how long it takes Super Argo to chop him in half and count the rings. So yeah. The but but the thing or is, got, or throw him in a swamp, or well, there you know there is that spoiler alert. Jeez, <laughs> God, there's just no there's no there's no trusting you, man. There's just Sorry. absolutely no he, trusting he, you. He may or may not get thrown into a swamp. How about that? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, you you vague that up enough. Good job. Uh, so uh, so the thing about Guy Madison is I have seen him in a lot of films. I think he, he mm. first of all he's very, he's a very good actor. I really enjoy watching him on screen. And uh, I think that any it, well, let's just put it this way: anybody who plays a character in the Beast of Hollow Mountain has got my vote. So uh, yeah. the 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 joys of watching him on screen is that he's he's he really presents well. He's 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 good either playing a good guy or a bad guy. And here, I like the sly way in which he's playing this character quite a bit. Are you have you been familiar with Guy Madison before? A, a little bit. I mean, I've definitely come across his films before. I mean, looking at the the sort of list of the, the way his career went, mm -hmm. he very much seems like the kind of actor that Tarantino was basing Rick Dalton on. Yes. In um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, how he had this great career, and then by the 60s he's in mainly in westerns on television, and then he goes off to Europe and becomes does a load of European stuff, including one of the Shatterhand westerns well that and he, he plays in you just uh, talked about yeah he plays a, a character in a couple of those of the the sandokan films yeah and he's done some euro spies mm -hmm. including the lsd film that, that hopefully we're going to do you're so uh, obsessed you know, with season. lsd flesh of the I know. Devil. flesh of the devil is the title yeah so yeah yeah so um yeah and then obviously turns up in something like this yeah interesting but Predominantly, I can see why <laughs> one Tom Tom, the dog who saved Hollywood, of course. That is a legend. Um, that is a legendary, yeah. <laughs> legendary quote unquote bad film that I've got to see one day. I can see how he's probably had a, a people would be more familiar with him on television in America than over here. Mm, I maybe, think. maybe. I mean, he uh, because he, he did di he did different things, but most of his career was on the big screen. I mean, yeah, he mm. turned up in an episode of Fantasy Island, but. <laughs> Who yeah. didn't? So, but then all of his war films and westerns would have just played on TV all the time. I'm guessing, probably so. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's interesting to see him turn up in this film as this sort of evil scientist who's basically they're kidnapping wrestlers and sports people, hollowing them out, and turning them into robots. Which makes you wonder, if they're so good at building robots, why do they need to put them inside people in the first place? I don't know. Is it just because they need the skin so that they present yeah. as human beings? I don't get it. Yeah. And then they've got the... They're sort of faceless, the title, Faceless Giants. All they are is men with um, stockings over their heads. <laughs> I that's, know, I, how they're, that's how they're doing the faceless thing. They've just got like a pair of tights on their head. It had been so long <laughs> since I'd rewatched this film, several years... That uh, I kept waiting for the moment where somebody yanked that pantyhose off of one of these things' face, <laughs> and we got a look at you know their kind of like dead white faces, yeah. and that would be some kind of shock moment. But nope, nope, mm, that is not no. what this film is interested in. Yeah, 
but yeah you're right about the the location work is really fun in this once we get out of the forest the, into the caves they've built all this uh, cool sci-fi mm-hmm. mad science laboratory in these caves um, we're also in caves in the first film of course um, when he in, when he infiltrates the secret island base where they've got all the uranium yeah. he has to swim underwater into an underground underwater entrance and then comes up through all these caves so caves play a prominent role in in both the films and in many of the films we've covered on this podcast this, they come up again and again the same caves well did you recognize uh, the female lead diana loris um yes was she the one who was working with professor one uh yes who's guy madison She's the daughter. So, because, yeah, they find out that there was this scientist who's now in an asylum. He's gone mad because of the things that he invented, which is something to do with artificial uh, hearts and organs. Right. And he was attempting is, to, he was attempting to create artificial organs. Yeah. And that is the work that uh, the Guy Madison character. Yeah, built his upon. daughter is working with Guy Madison. Um, I didn't particularly recognize her, but I was she Spanish? Was she our, one of our Spanish cast? Uh, Diana Loris, she was in a number of... Uh, yes, she is Spanish. She was in a number of uh, uh, films where she stands out for me, not the least of which is a fantastic role in uh, Paul Nashie's Blue Eyes of the Broken Doll. Uh-huh. Uh, she, she's very, very good in that. Uh, she's in a, in a strong, she's in a strong female cast in that movie, and she's, and she's very good. But she was also in uh, Amado de Osorio's Fangs of the Living Dead and oh, right. uh, Jess Franco's Nightmares Come at Night, which I can also recommend. Um, I, I do recognize, just looking at her credits, she's in Operazione Goldman, also mm-hmm. known as Lightning Bolt, the right. um, sort of Euro spy film by Margaret So I have seen that one. Right. And so she's uh, she's uh, she she has a role also in Franco's first horror film, The Awful Doctor Orloff, back in '62. She's nice. a strikingly attractive woman. She uh, is described as a redhead in this movie, and that that does appear to be true. I'm not sure if that was her natural hair color or not, but she's uh, uh, an absolutely gorgeous and talented lady. And I, it was it, it it was sad to re- to realize that there was this massive gap in her career. She came back. And did some, uh, did a movie in 2010, but it doesn't look like she uh, retired from uh, filmmaking oh, right. in uh, the late 70s. Okay. Um, uh, and that is a shame because I've really enjoyed her and everything I've seen her in. And so uh, uh, it's good to see her in this as well. Um, mm. The character has a. She's, I, I won't say she doesn't have much to do, but she she has a couple, She has only a few notes that she needs to hit, but. It's good to see her uh, in there doing what needs to be done. Yeah, and she starts to doubt, doesn't she, as to whether what she's doing is actually a good idea. Mm-hmm. Which is she, kind, she kind of turns and starts trying to defend uh, Super Argo and keep her and to keep him from yeah. um, keep him from uh, being killed by the by the villain. Uh, and she kind of has a, a different vision than our super villain. And that's neat. That sets up a, a nice tension yeah. between uh, the two quote unquote bad guys. Because there's a bit in the so in the English one, um, at one point. Kamir or Kabir, whatever he's however they pronouncing it, um, his guru, who's basically like his sidekick. He's also because mm-hmm. they they dis- they discover oh that's it, they discover that they can fight these robots with um, laser guns, so they head back to fight them with their laser guns and they're shooting and he's shooting. They're both shooting these robots, zapping so them in the in, chest. Yeah, but then um, Kabir falls into the swamp and has to be rescued, and whilst. Super Argo is trying to rescue him. They get captured by the robots and they end up in, in a cell and that's when they face torture and, and mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff. And that's where there's a whole chunk that suddenly disappears in the English language version. But um, yeah, and then, yeah, like I said before, he gets put into a Iron Maiden. They're drawing on, it's almost like they're drawing on the heritage the, uh, of the Gothic. Like it's a scientific lab in a cave, but he's also got an Iron Maiden, which is particularly. I know. It, it, this film has a odd. has a lot of different visual, a lot, a lot mm. of different visual things it's drawing from it. From it's it's really kind of odd. Yeah. Well, you've you've won me round. 
Oh, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, stand your, stand your ground, Adrian. Fight me. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, they're both good fun. Um, and his costume is very much kind of drawing on a little bit diabolic, but also a little bit sort of the phantom, I guess. Yeah, That kind yeah. of thing as well. This one isn't a comic. So whereas Criminal, that we talked about last time, was based on a, on a Fumetti this was a character who's like I, th- I read some. I think it was Robert Cur- Roberto Curti's book. He said that this was Italy's first superhero, like they that he was um, written specifically for the screen, rather than adapting from a, a comic. But hmm. clearly, clearly drawing on on the sort of comic style with, with some of the things that he does. But interesting. I wondered whether with the second film, where they're trying to cash in on the connections to Diabolic by one of the alternative titles being The King of Criminals because obviously that's kind of what um, Diabolic was known as if, so I don't know, it's a bit odd but he is a hero so mm-hmm. it doesn't really make any sense It doesn't. I yeah. found so I, as far as I can tell the first film didn't get a release in the UK and I couldn't find any evidence of any American reviews either um, but the second film seems to have had more distribution um, on VHS and stuff as well. The uh, and I found a review in it was released in the UK, but weirdly, not until 1975. Really? <laughs> so yeah, it came out over here seven years later, distributed by Fox. Um, and so I looked up the review and brilliantly. The review is written by my friend David McGillivray, uh, which is hilarious. He was right. He did a lot of reviews for Monthly Film Bulletin back in the 60s and 70s. Um, he, David McGillivray is the same guy who wrote Satan's Slave and mm-hmm. um, Terror and House of Whipcord and Frightmare and, you know, all that cool stuff. Um, and I interviewed him for the Norman J. Warren book and I've got to know him a little bit and I've been to his house and he's a really nice guy. Anyway, so it turns out he wrote the review of Super Argo back in 1975. Uh, Il Rey de Criminali, as it says in here, a.k.a. Super Argo and the Faceless Giants. I'll just read you what he says. In the hierarchy of superheroes, Super Argo, little more than a bruiser in a bulletproof leotard, must rate lower than Jungle Jim. <laughs> Appropri- <laughs> Appropriately enough, he is accompanied on his adventures by one of the most morose of sidekicks, and pitted against one of the most harmless-looking villains, Guy Madison, completely miscast. The routine, Bond-flavoured action flows consistently enough to please easily pleased children, but comic strip aficionados will find even less to arouse them here than in Doc Savage. Oh, wow. So they're comparing it to the 1975 Doc Savage film. So that's, yeah, okay. I mean, it's a bit late, 1975. Very. I can see the film doing better in the 60s. Maybe. Um, I, I would yeah. like to say that uh, clearly I am uh, one of the easily pleased children because I enjoy <laughs> this film. <laughs> well, um, aren't we all? That's why we're here. Um, <laughs> we're both. I, I think we both exactly. often fit into that category, Adrian. Yeah. Talking seriously about films that most people stopped watching when they were about 14. Or stopped watching about 15 or, minutes into. Yeah, or well, that's true as well. Uh, but speaking of which, I think this super, the second Super Argo, wasn't it on Mystery Science Theater at some point? Um, oh my goodness, I can't remember. I think one of them was. Yeah. Um, so, because I, I, I think the second, second film, the second film did have better distribution outside, in, in, in with its English language version, so outside of Europe. Okay. So I think that's probably why that one's shown up a bit more. Whereas the first Super Argo turned up on the German version of Mystery Science Theatre. So, um, yeah, there you go. Well, I will admit that uh, I know that the uh, the Riff Tracks fellows, the guys who were uh, were part of the Mystery Science Theatre family, did a uh, did a Riff Track for uh, the second film. And I have put that to the side for uh, future listening because I, I, I didn't want I didn't want to listen to it to kind of taint myself and to uh, okay to, to, <laughs> to talk about this film without having the the jokes in mind but I am looking forward to rewatching the second film with the riff tracks guys making fun of it uh, that, that will be fun yeah well, I should probably have a look at that as well well there you go so there we are super Argo double bill 
fun for all the family. Well, now, I have a question for you. This is our second yeah. episode of this season. In both cases, mm-hmm. uh, the, the uh, well, villain in the first one, hero in the second one, only managed to eke out two cinematic adventures. And... Yep. Um, I, I'm I'm a little I'm a little surprised. I'll I'll be clear about this as we go on through this through these films as we continue this series. I'm uh, th- this is not the way things play out. Uh, I think we may have uh, inadvertently kind of front loaded the uh, the reoccurring the ones the ones that did get a sequel because I don't yeah. think many of them did because I think the no. Euro spy genre that they're really kind of a part of the this this kind of a subset of them. I think they burned themselves out pretty hard and fast. But yep. um, uh, if if there are more sequels coming, I, I don't think there were many. Uh, I think there may have been like one reoccurring or two reoccurring like Euro spy guys. But as far as the Fumetti films, I think these are the ones with sequels. Are there any more that you're aware of? Not really. Not that I've got on the list anyway. Um they are all standalone films. I mean, some because our next episode is going to be about Argo Man, mm-hmm. the fantastic Superman, and that one I think really did deserve some sequels, but didn't get any, which is a shame. Yeah. yeah. Um, but considering the popularity of the comics that some of these did come from, and obviously Danger Diabolic is the obvious one where there should have been sequels at the time. Oh yeah. Um, but even something like Satanic and. Um, Avenger X, I think that one's from a comic. Like you would have thought that there would have been more of an appetite for it, but like you said, maybe just because the the Euro Spy thing was such a huge um but short lived genre that they just sort of fizzled out with it. I think I so. Suppose. Yeah. That's the only thing that I can think of as yeah, an explanation. It's basically from nineteen sixty six to sixty nine and then I've thrown in a, an extra one from 1974 at the end, the Super Stooges versus the Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> which which <laughs> I am I, so looking forward to revisiting. I know, because I'm basically a sadomasochist, yes, so I'm inflicting yes. it on both of us. You've, 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 um, de- you've decided to pull out the, pull out the, uh, the torture devices there at the end. But, but, the, uh, but it, just in the last few years in Italy, there have been a, there's been a new diabolic trilogy. So the third diabolic film's just coming out this year called, I think it's next month. And I've not seen any, I've not seen any of those. So mm. well, I'm going to send you the first one so you can watch it. We'll we'll talk about that at the end of the season. You are a sweet, um, sweet man. But yeah, Diabolic Kise or Diabolic Who Are You is coming out uh, soon. So so yeah, so that's a sort of that's happened now. But clearly, back in the '60s would have been better to have had a few more. But yeah, it's a shame. So you're right. We've done two sets of sequels, but f- but from now on. We are just standalone films, which might make for slightly shorter episodes as well. Uh, maybe, maybe so, but, but I'm, we'll see. I'm sure we'll find reasons to back. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk about Argo Man, the Fantastic Superman, next time. That is a film. I, 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 I I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. I love that movie. I can't wait to talk about yeah, it. It's gonna be really fun. Well, thank you everybody for being with us to uh, to cover Super Argo. Uh, I think we've, hopefully, we've done him justice. I think you know overall. We like him, even <laughs> if he, even if the um, Olympic Committee are not so keen. Yeah, so we've got Argo Man coming up. In the meantime, do um, subscribe to us on YouTube, mm-hmm. leave us a review. Oh, and thank you to people who have left us reviews. I discovered the other day how to find reviews on Apple, but it, it makes you look for it by individual country. So I managed three oh. countries, and there's like another... 250 countries to go so it might take me a while to find all the reviews but somebody in australia left us a review so thank you very much if you're listening and that was you get in touch we'd love to talk to somebody in australia certainly um and then also some reviews in america and uk reviews so if that was any of you listening thank you very much for that we really appreciate that um if i can find a way to see the reviews on apple more easily than having to look at each individual country that might help because maybe there's some more that I just don't know about. But yeah, if you want to get in touch with us, we are on Instagram, we are on Twitter, and uh, email at um, which is just uh, Wild Wild Podcast at gmail dot com. Uh, Mark got in touch with us just today. Actually, it's almost like he knew we were recording today to suggest that we could think about doing a Tinto Brass season. Oh, because I, that's Tinto not Brass. A bad idea. 
Tinder Brass is all the rage these days. His films are starting to get 4K uh, releases. There's been a new Caligula cut just come out. True. And there is a big coffee table book uh, just coming out about Tinto Brass. Now, for me, I am slightly hesitant. I mean, would, I'd have to be very specific, I think, about which Tinto Brass films I'd want to cover. Mm. Cause, okay. Because, you know, they very easily just tip into... Uh, Porn. In fact, well, yeah, okay, yes. There's too many naked ladies on the covers of those films for me to bring them into the house. <laughs> and I definitely couldn't own a Tinto Brass coffee book. That would be <laughs> I can understand, but, yes, of course. But I do like his early 60s films. Like Deadly Sweet is a kind of comic book inspired Jallo that's really good, set in swinging London. Well, see, I'd that's the well- thing, is my knowledge of Tinto Brass's career is very limited. Uh, I've, yeah. I've only dipped my toes into some of the more obvious things that mm. kind, you know kind of veer into the near pornographic yes. realm. So uh, that would it would be a, yeah. a, a way to educate myself on his career and, and, and his films. So that would be fun. Have, yeah, have you ever seen Salon Kitty? Uh, yes, years ago. Yes, yeah, that oh, one got a cool. that one got a, a DVD release over here. Yeah. You know, years and years my ago. Goodness. So. There are some things I saw in that film that are seared into my brain. <laughs> Do they do they mostly involve <laughs> naked men doing athletic athletic uh, uh, things? Oh no, it's more. Oh no, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to say it out loud while oh, people are listening because I understand. I don't want to upset anybody who might be eating their lunch whilst listening to this. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well, then I think I I have a suspicion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Mark. That's a great suggestion. I might add it to the list of future. Perhaps not a full you know six month season but maybe a mini season that could work that could be fun yeah um so yes rod you just recently uh had an episode out about the 60s edgar wallace uh, not edgar wallace i'm obsessed with edgar wallace <laughs> let me start that again you have an episode out about the 60s dr mabuza films yes yes which i enjoyed listening to um, i do own the first one of those on blu-ray and mm-hmm. I haven't watched it yet, so you're encouraging me to hurry up and watch that. Oh, I think they're um, they're all, bar the very last one, I think well worth seeing. I think the last one really does fall down pretty hard. But there, you know, when you have a series of six films, I think that it's, mm. you know, eventually the the quality is going to flag. Sure. But uh, those those '60s Mabusa films are a great entertainment, and uh, the I, I was able to speak with uh, my buddy uh, Holger Haza over the. Over the interwebs and uh, the uh, joys of talking about those movies are multitudinous. Glad you enjoyed the show. Yeah, we got mm. uh, often when we, I mean, it, the show's a little over two hours long, and we knew it was going to be uh, tough to kind of talk in, it, talk, talk about all six of those movies within a certain period of time. So we do apologize for the length, but man, come on, it's six <laughs> movies. Yeah, no, it was good. I need to watch them. Um, he also, because he did, uh, as well as his little book that you talked about, he wrote a big magazine article recently as mm-hmm. well about that so yeah he knows his stuff uh anything else that you want to plug anything upcoming that you want people to be aware of um the next episode of the bloody pit will be coming out in a week or two which is focused on the uh the amazing paul bartell film eating raul if you've never nice. seen it you should if you have seen it you'll know why we're talking about it because yeah. it is very funny and uh, well, any chance to talk about uh, Mary Warnoff is a is a is a good reason to have a conversation. So, yeah. uh, my uh, Patreon is perking along. Uh, I do uh, I call it Rod's Rants and Reviews. Uh, not a lot of ranting on the on there. Mostly, I, I treat it uh, <laughs> as a way to once again speak to people who are crazy enough to actually want to pay three bucks a month to listen to me talk about s- silly things for ten or fifteen minutes. Uh, and so this week I. I well past several weeks I've been shocked by how much I enjoyed the recent Dungeons and Dragons film. I've talked a little bit about uh, Boston Blackie movies from the 1940s, and then also um, laid out why I was disappointed with the recent film release of uh, re- the film release Argyle. So it swings all over the place, people. Oh, very good. So you do watch films from the 21st century all of the time. Not just the old stuff. Oh yeah. Oh well. If if you get the opportunity, everyone highly recommend suitable flesh from last year. Um, 
very much a an excellent uh, uh, H.P. Lovecraft adaptation. Really oh, yeah. pleased with that film. Very well mm. done. Oh, there we go. Modern recommendations. What is this mm-hmm. podcast coming to? Oh, I know, I know. Okay, well, on that note, um, let's say goodbye. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll be back again soon. Bye. Bye, everyone.